one taken. Salutation. Welcome. Welcome to this world of Dr. Sebi. The organic world. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, over the years, I have been asked so many times by many of you, Dr. Sebi, how did you learn to put these compounds together? How did you know what to choose from the forest? Well, I could tell you stories about how I would lead to it. But for me to say today that I did it on my own recognizance and that I am that wise. No, I'm not. I did, didn't happen that way. How did it happen? You see, I have been now on this planet 82 years and over the last 60 years, I have been very well aware about activities that revolverate around the diaspora and that which includes our culture, the black man, as we are called. Well, there are many of us that have many expressions about blackness, and they all are good because they showed growth. We're growing. Noble Drew Ali, Marcus Garvey. They are most honorable. Elijah Muhammad, the Holy Apostle. Then you have people like, you know, Benjamin Banneker, George Drew. All these men, they fit in this chronology, in this sequence, in this procession. What we see here is this. Dr. Sebi drew from all of these people and still drawing from you. What I came to the conclusion very early and I couldn't verbalize it because in the 60s, the talk was philosophy. It was Herodotus. It was Pliny. It was Socrates. It was Plato, Diogenes, Aristotle. Well, I couldn't participate in their conversations in Los Angeles with the great Ron Karinga and Kalu, Chaka, Lee Drawn, they all entertained these very heavy, important subjects. I couldn't participate. Why? Because I could never put my finger on something that these people were saying that related to blackness. Couldn't. And I grew up in a black house in Honduras as a little boy. So I couldn't take part in their dialogue. Sometimes I would feel handicapped. Sometimes mm, a little bit like emotionally disturbed because I want to participate. But what I didn't know and I didn't notice was that life had it arranged for me to keep my big mouth shut. Yes, I kept my big mouth shut. From age 30 until about age 47. Those 17 years, I was able to put together or I was able to receive from the natural arrangement of life 
what was really going on. Well, this is what I saw. This is what I received. The black race didn't have a philosophy. They didn't need a philosophy. Europe needed philosophers. Why did Europe and not Africa? You see, Africans, we live by the laws of life. That's the model. The laws of life. Do we need a philosophy? No. We just follow the natural law. Are we confused? Well, the eagle makes her nest before she lays her egg. And she weave, and she weave that nest quite well. Where did she go on to weave that nest? Who teach that eagle to weave that nest? That's a big bird going to be in there, you know, including herself. Where did she learn that? She didn't learn it. It was always part of her DNA. It's inscribed, indelibly imprinted in her DNA. And what about the bear? in the Alaskan tundra, when it gets cold, not her den. She right in the middle of the cold, but she knows how to fix that den and to shape that hole that the wind would not bother her and her cubs while she's in her den. Where did she learn that? It only shows that we too are part of that cosmic arrangement, that procession. So today, it is philosophy against cosmic, or versus cosmic, or cosmic versus philosophy. Philosophy is about the assumption, I believe, I believe, I believe, I assume, I think. With us, not so. I know. There's a difference. Philosophy is based on belief and on assumptions. When you don't have a philosophy and you follow the laws of life, which should be the model, then you don't have to believe in anything. You know. So today, we're going to see the difference. The products of philosophy, notice carefully now, we don't want to confuse this issue. The product of philosophy is always a chemical. Arsenides, cyanides, mercury, and antimony. These are the products of philosophy. They are made in a laboratory expecting them to assimilate with the human body. Come on now, that's philosophy. Again, I repeat, cyanides, arsenides, mercury and antimony, these are the products of philosophy. These are applied to food and medicine. With the black man, not so. Ours is organic. Ours is natural. So we go just the opposite of arsenides, cyanide, antimony, and mercury. 
These are protoplasmic poisons. Ah, now we travel into the organic world, the world that is free of philosophy. We want to make sure that when we enter the field of nutrition or of addressing disease, you don't want to go into that arena believing because I could believe that I'm giving you mullin, but it is fox glove, and I'm going to poison you because they look alike. I have to know. So with the black man not having a philosophy, what do, where are we left with? The model of life, nature itself. So from nature, we get phosphates, carbonates, iodides, and bromides. These are considered by biochemistry as food and vitalizers, not protoplasmic poison, phosphates, carbonates, iodides, and bromides. You mean to tell me that I have to learn these things? Oh yes, Dr. Sebi. You have to learn the language of biochemistry. Hey, but how old it, fellas? Like, uh, is that necessary? Today it is. Why? Because when our mothers was taken away from the forest, we, she was introduced to the mechanical world. So we have to understand the mechanical language. But in the forest, we didn't have to know about cyanide, arsenide, mercury, and antimony because they didn't exist. And we didn't have to learn about phosphates, carbonates, iodides, and bromide because that's all we had. So whatever selection you made, you were right on time. But we lost that ability. We lost that ability over the 500 years of eating things that offends us. We're not able to select from the forest or to even know what to eat. Could you imagine that I, the educated man, need a nutritionist to hold my hand? A nutritionist need to come and hold my hand to show me what to eat. Does an elephant have a nutritionist? Does a gorilla have a nutritionist? The answer is no. But then, the nutritionist who is supposed to be educated and that their understanding of food is above all everybody else, guess what? Correct me if I'm wrong. The nutritionist, uh, you have to eat your protein. You have to eat your protein. You need your protein. The nutritionist is telling us that we need our protein. They went to school. Now why do they have to hold your hands to show you show us that we need protein. The gorilla doesn't hold anybody's hand to show them what they need to eat. They know. It's coded in the DNA. So you see, when Messenger Elijah Muhammad said that they gave us the wrong food to eat, we didn't realize the extent of the damage that was done to the brain and to the central nerve system only because we cease honoring our mother and our father. It wasn't our fault, yours nor mine, or anyone else. 
but the time has arrived that it is right in front of, of our face. Whether you are Christian, whether you are a Muslim, whether you are a Buddha, or you are Hebrew Israelite, not to mention Jewish, they all come to the Usha village for what? The cure of their disease. So you see, and that including Dr. Sebi, we all are sick. Regardless to your religious belief. So we come to this juncture in which we have to put forth a level of understanding that's going to take us beyond religion. And why is that? Well, a few things. Uh, religions. The Christian had me eating pork, which is going to hurt me. It hurt me for many years. It hurt me until, nine, until I was 30. It hurt me. Messenger Elijah Muhammad came into my life and removed it. Then I had to leave what he, the messenger, recommended. Lamb and carrots. I couldn't eat that either. But the messenger always said that the best Muslim was still in the street. In fact, the messenger knew, and I knew this from his mouth. I ate with messenger Elijah Muhammad in 1959 in Chicago on Woodlawn Avenue. Present was John Ali, National Secretary, Supreme Captain Raymond Sharif, and there was myself and Harry Nance from New Orleans and the messenger. And while the messenger is cutting the meatloaf, he was looking at us and he said, we should never, we should stop eating meat. So we're growing. You see, Christianity helped me. Islam helped me. The Hebrew Israelite helped me. But the time has come. I now have to help them because we cannot eat the tofu that the Hebrew Israelite is selling us because it's going to hurt us. Tofu, my brothers and sisters, is starch. Starch is not a food. Starch is known in the scientific world as carbonic acid. It's not a food. It creates another level and a reaction that produces sulfides in the body. Sulfides does one thing and one thing alone, rob you of your oxygen. And this is why, this is why many of our patients that is cancerous of the breast, or of the reproductive organ, are Muslims, or Hebrew Israelite. Why? Because the Hebrew Israelite is giving our sisters this tofu, which is robbing them of their iron and weakening their system. Well, we are not going to blame our brothers and the religion of the Hebrew Israelite for doing that. No. Today is not about blaming anyone. It's about us realizing that that which we know as constant is on top of us today. They call it change. Change is the only thing that is constant. And as that change takes place, we move and we change with it. Sure, I like to go to the restaurants of the Hebrew Israelites. I like to go to the Islamic restaurant in, in Detroit, on Michigan Avenue, Agnatum. But I want to go in there and eat something good. So now, for us to do that, we have to help the brothers and the sisters to produce the things that are good for us, not to condemn them, 
We're not going to talk about Yahweh ben Yahweh. We're not going to talk about Minister Fayakan. No, we're not going to talk about Reverend Al Sharpton. We're going to help them to understand that there has been a paradigm shift and that we are responsible for responding to that shift. Yes, I love Muslims. Yes, I love Hebrew Israelites. Not to mention Christians. Every time I think about you Christians, I think about Reverend Littleton in, uh, in Memphis. And I think about Reverend Jordan in, a, in, in a Louisiana, New Orleans, that used to feed me. And they laugh at me. You Muslims, they're feeding you. I got to give you a job to eat. <laughs> but it was all beautiful. So yes, you see, philosophy against that which is cosmic. That which is cosmic is consistent with life. That is truth. Truth is that would support life. And that would support life, you know. Yeah, brothers and sisters. Change has arrived. But we shouldn't resist it. Because if we resist it, imagine our children are going to suffer. I have a little boy. He's only a year old, David. I, I got to talk to his mother constantly about what she's going to put in my baby's mouth beside her breast. Taiwa, well, I had to raise my little girl with sea moss and hemp milk. You understand? And then she had her spelled bread. But she's four years of age now, and she's telling me what I need to do. Now imagine that. But it all comes with help. So yes, philosophy does not fit in life vernacular. It is cosmic. It's got to be organic. It's got to be native. It is electrical. And that is where Dr. Sebi draws his energy from. That black woman in the jungles of Africa. She and she is one of part of the organic family. Africa, the African, the Aztecs, the Olmecs, the Toltecs, the Incas, the American Indian, they all makes up the organic family. But there is something that we all had in common, the organic family. We didn't have a toilet because of a fecal matter, didn't stench because we didn't eat anything for that to occur. We were clean. We ate only that which was alkali. So even our fecal matter went back into the soil. Recyclable. Yes. I had to fight some uphill little things in the past, you know, Obstacles, they call them. One is that I was taken to the Bronx Botanic Center in November of 1987, questioned by botanists from Yale and Harvard or Princeton. I know what they were doing. She I was arrested, and my case began in 88. Now they want to test me. And they sent these people to see if my premise was consistent, if my foundation was solid. Well, I don't really have to prove myself to anybody. I just got to produce. I was always about production, not talking. So the man said, the Jewish man, are you acquainted with the works of Dr. David Ayansu that he's trying to find 
the cure leukemia using the rosy periwinkle? I said, I think I am. What do you know of it? I said, well, Dr. David Ayansu is looking for the cure of leukemia by isolating the active ingredient in the rosy periwinkle. But the rosy periwinkle is a hybrid plant. It's an acid-based plant. It was cross-pollinated in Madagascar by the French. Because it was cross-pollinated and it isn't a product of nature, the base is acid. That's the secret. No big secret. If nature didn't make it, don't take it. If nature didn't make it, don't take it. Don't take it if nature didn't make it. This I heard from the mouth of some sisters in Philadelphia when I gave a speech. And they were right. You see, nature doesn't make anything with starch. And the rosy periwinkle has starch. No healing. So enough for the research of Dr. David Ayen Su. He's a beautiful brother. He's from Ghana. He's a member of the Smithsonian Institution. But we have to help Dr. David Ayen Su to understand certain things. Like we have to help Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, you always make these recommendations across the board. One size fits all. No, brother. We love you, Gupta. But we see where you need to raise your level of understanding. Because when you talk, you seem to forget that there is a genetical thing that needs to be considered. My genetic predisposition is not the same as a Caucasian or Chinese or an Eskimo. We are different. Hey, Sanjay? So when you go back talking about treatment and complimenting, be careful, man. You have to know something about our genetical predisposition, which I don't think that they taught you in school. So we want you to know that you need to revamp your position. As far as Dr. Deepak Chopra, we also love you. But you were the one that asked me, why did I remove from Teddy Pendergrass eggs? and steaks and chicken when you said to me that these are the things that constitute protein. Dr. Deepak, you too, we need to help you. And we are willing to do so. You see, when we African talk, we talk from a position that is linked to the procession of life. So, Dr. Deepak Chopra, when you told Teddy in front of me, when you told me in front of Teddy that I was not supposed to do such thing, you forgot that everything on Teddy was moving that was never supposed to move again. We are not in opposition to you, but you doesn't know anything about the African and our cellular structure or predisposition. Sanjay Gupta and Dr. Deepak Chopra, we are willing to help you. Believe me, we have to live up to our position. Remember, we are the African. We are the one that have a long history of complimenting people because we are obedient to the laws of life. So you see, that's right, there has been a paradigm shift where brothers and sisters just come with the shift. Today, I hope that the little presentation and the few minutes would have helped to clarify much of the fog 
that exists in our understanding. There is such thing as the organic and the inorganic, the alive and the dead. Protein has no place in the human body because it is non-electrical. We are electrical. Electric body, electric food. That is chemical affinity. That is digestion. That is assimilation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And this is the one of the chapters from the African Biomineral Balance. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you very much.